Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, it's my great pleasure to do, uh, introduce Ping Li from um, Cornell University. Um, he's been here before. He's did uh, a couple of highly successful internships, and he will be talking to us about um, boosted decision trees, which is interesting um, from a personal perspective because they've been used in a number of um, click-through prediction um, applications very successfully. Um, and with that, Ping Li. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really nice to be back. In the so, so this is about uh, th this talk is about multi-class classifications. So my my, my first slide is just to tell you what is a multi-class classification. So this example, ten class classifications, and uh, and uh, so everybody in this class in this room knows about it. So, so the the purpose of this slide is, to, is just to tell you what is my zip code. So, so let me go to the second slide. So this is a ten class classification problem. So the next slide is just a brief review. As of what we did uh, 2006 and 2007, says well, when, when if we do when we do ranking, uh, we can use a classification to, to do ranking. For example, uh, the MC rank is the learning to rank using multi-class classification. This is done with uh, Chris Burgess and uh, Wu Chang, and uh, so to do classification, we need a, uh, we need the X and the Y. So Y is the response, and X is the we need the X and the Y. So Y is the response. So, so, so x is the feature vectors. How do we get feature vectors? Well, we just generate feature vectors are generated by combining the feature, the query words with with the web pages. So, for example, the first feature vector is a query one plus URL one. The second feature vector could be query one, same query, could be same query plus URL two. Then we generate many, many feature vectors, and the human judges determine the relevance for each feature feature vector, and uh, into one of the five classes. So, the zero to four. So, what we did is. We first solve a five class classification problem and then ranks the URLs according to this expected relevance. It's called expected relevance. So we get the class probabilities. Then we uh, each class probability multiplied by the class label. So we get a uh, we get a, a relevance scores and uh, so that allows us to rank the URLs because this gives you the real number. So it's a real number. So we can use that to re rank the web pages. And otherwise, if you just do the brute force classifications. Uh, we could, we're going to get lots of ties, and then it's not, it's not good. It's not going to be good enough to rank the web pages. So, so this is a very nice trick, and to use. Okay, so that's uh, how we uh, use classification to solve ranking problems. This is one fairly successful example, and uh, so a little bit formal definition of a multi-class classification is, uh, we're given the training data set, and the uh, x and y. So x is a uh, feature vector, which may be in p dimensions, and y is ranges from 0 to k minus 1. So we have a k class classification problem. And uh, the task, you did not miss anything. So the task is to learn a function which predicts a class label at y from x i's. So uh, when k is equal to 2, this is a binary classification problem. And when k is larger than 2, this is a multi-class classification problem. And this talk is about k minus 2, k larger than 2 k's. So uh, we're talking about multi-class classifications. So one strategy, there are many, many strategies for, for multi-class classifications. For one strategy is to, first we learn the class probabilities. Now, so PK is a class probability, which says, well, given, H, given feature vector x, what is the probability that y, the response, belong to one of the k classes? Uh, so, so we know that probabilities have to sum to 1, so therefore, Instead of, uh, instead, of k, instead of k degrees of freedom, we have k minus 1 degrees of freedom only. So this is a, we only have k minus 1 degrees of freedom. Like uh, both hands have to be busy. So this is a, just, normally they have this laser pointer here, right? But this one doesn't have, it. yeah. So, so uh, a simple rule is to, well, once you learn the class probabilities, pk, you just use the maximum class probabilities for, you use the class that generates a lot maximum class probabilities as the class label. So that's a very simple loop. And uh, 
So as, as we said, in, in many applications, the cost of probability is more important than the, than the cost labels. But not, not, not in every ap application, at least in some important applications, we care about cost probabilities. So again, this is just one of the many successful strategies for multi-class classifications. So uh, now, in order to learn the class probabilities, we need the model. So this is one of the very successfully used model called multinomial logic probability model, is that we first learn a function value, f. So we have a k classes, so, we, so l little k ranges from, from 0 to k minus 1. And uh, so once we learn the function value f, then we can compute the class probabilities, pk, by this uh, log logistic transformations. So this function value f in logistic regression is just a linear combination of the features. And the task is, is to learn beta. Of course, in boosting, we're going to learn more complicated models than this linear model. So this is a multinomial logic, logic probability model. And uh, this we often use the constraints because we only have k minus 1 degrees of freedom. So we, there's a constraint, natural constraints. People like to impose is that the, the function values should sum to 0 because we really only have k minus 1 degrees of freedom. And uh, to understand this constraint a little bit better, so suppose, uh, this is a, uh, suppose we add the same constant c to the function value f, the same constant c, so we, after this transformation, we can notice that uh, this function value, the c, the constant, does not really matter because it's going to, it's going to be canceled. So therefore, uh, the function value f, they are not uniquely identified. So therefore, for identifiability problem issues, we have to impose some kind of constraints. Otherwise, it's, uh, we're going to have identifiability issues. So one popular and very natural kind of choice is to assume that the sum of this k function values equal to a constant, which is just equivalent to, say, well, the, 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 sum, the sum of k function values equal to 0. Because you can just always subtract the, subtract the mean, and you get the sum to 0 constraints. So therefore, this is very natural constraints, and it's a, is, it's a very commonly used, and if you read many classification papers, you can see that this constraint is always used, almost always used. Except uh, after very nice uh, discussion with Chris, and, and, and why do we need these constraints? Like, maybe there's more profound reasons and the people we can explore. And, uh, but uh, as a matter of fact, this is a constraint that's always, almost always used if you read any multi class classification papers. So we're not inventing anything, so we just use that. So uh, now we have the probability model. The next task is to learn, is to, is to learn the function value f. So we can learn the function value f by, maximize, by maximizing the multinomial likelihood. So, so now suppose, uh, because we have a multinomial model, so we just need to maximize the likelihood. Suppose the function value, the, the, the class label is k. So therefore, the likelihood is proportional to, uh, we, have, we only have one cell. One cell has number one. The rest of the cell has number zero, has, 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 uh, has label zero. So therefore, the likelihood is proportional to the probability of that particular class. So it's only, only one term here. And uh, or equivalent here, we can maximize the log likelihood, which is usually more convenient. Or in machine learning, we like to talk about loss functions instead of uh, likelihood, maximizing likelihood. So we like to use negative log likelihood loss, which basically uh, use a negative, put a negative sign in the front. So this gives us the, the negative log likelihood loss function. So this, not, so this loss function is very commonly used, and it's nothing magic about this loss function. It's just the, maxim, it's just, it's just the likelihood lo loss function. It's just the likelihood function. And to uh, minimize this is equivalent to to doing maximum likelihood estimation. So all we're doing is maximum likelihood estimation. So here, in logistic, logistical regressions, uh, this function value is, is assumed to be a linear function, and the task is to learn the betas. And uh, we, we, of course, we do more sophisticated things than just linear models. And uh, so for each individual uh, sample point, we, we, we have like an observation, so for each 
one of the observations we have lost, and the total loss is just summation of all the loss, losses. So we, it's usually more convenient to write this in, in a double summation form. So use the indicator function. So if, if y belong to a particular class k, so we, so we have this r vector, that only one of them has value 0, and all the rest has a value 1, and all the, all the others has value 0. So therefore, this inner summation really only has one turn. This is just for convenience. So this is the total loss function. And again, to help, to help us understand this sum to zero constraints, let's look at the Hessians of this model. It's actually a singular model if you do not consider the constraints. For example, uh, without assuming these constraints, just assume there's no relationships among the f values, we can uh, derive the, the derivatives and the second derivatives. And we can see, for example, when k is equal to 3, the Hessian is this. And we take the determinant. And uh, so the determinant of the Hessian is actually 0, which, which can be verified by algebra. So we should not surprise it because we only have k minus 1 degree of freedom. And uh, so this has to be 0. It's, not, it's a singular problem. And so what uh, Friedman and uh, Trevor Hasty, what, what they have done is they use diagonal approximation of the Hessians. So they start, uh, they start with, uh, uh, with the full matrix, but they only use a diagonal, diagonal part of it. And they consider a factor, which is really like a heuristic factor. And uh, I can show this, uh, it's, it's, why it's a heuristic factor. But uh, they use factors to, to, to roughly consider that we only have k minus 1 degrees of freedom. And so this is the, the diagonal uh, approximation of the Hessian for k is, is equal to 3 case in Friedman and Trevor's papers. And uh, so again, so without the constraints, we get a singular problem. Of course, once you've done the diagonal approximation, it's, it's no longer singular. So this is a, but it's a, then you consider a heuristic factor k minus 1 over k to take into account the fact that we only have k minus 1 degrees of freedom. So, uh, so then uh, Friedman has this algorithmic function gradient boosting. It's much more flexible and accurate than logistic regression. Again, we have data sets with n training samples, and we have a lot differentiable loss function. In this case, it's a logistic loss. And uh, Friedman took a, took a greedy stage-wise approach to build an additive model. So instead of a linear, instead of a linear model, they have this it's an additive model means it's a sum of m terms, capital M terms, m maybe a thousand or ten thousand, and uh, so there, there are two two things. First is a is a weak learner called h, which is a parameterized by a, and this row which is a coefficient. So it's a linear combination of weak learners, so uh, which can be a regression tree, for example. So such as that at each stage, uh, Friedman they did a greedy. They try to do a, a greedy approximation. So every step, they try to minimize the loss. So this is a greedy, a greedy approach. However, even this is a difficult problem because, because this uh, rho and a, a can be vectors. So if you want to learn them simultaneously, it's a uh, it's difficult, but very difficult problem. So what Jerry did is, uh, well, uh, they, they approximately conduct steepest descent in the function space by solving this square problem. So they can first, they first solve for the, for the A. So we have two parameters, two sets of parameters to, uh, to work on. So the first, they solve for A, then they solve for rho. And uh, so they solve for A by solving this square problem, and which is a, can be viewed as approximately viewed as a steepest descent in the function space. So in this case, we need a, to do a steepest descent. That means we need a, the derivatives. So, so this is the derivative of the loss function with respect to the function values. And, uh, and if then for rho, they, what, they do, what, what, what he did is uh, he did line search. So, so that's how he solved the complicated problem by two simple optimization problems. And uh, we know that because this is a least square problem, which can be easily solved by, by trees instead of doing least squares. Of course, you can always do least square, but you can also do, do trees. So, so this is a generic gradient boosting algorithm. And is that we start, uh, for, we do like M, capital M iterations. At every iteration, we compute, uh, we compute the, uh, the, the gradient, uh, evaluate the gradient at the previous function values, mm -hmm. then use that, then feed the gradient 
by uh, by, by the least square by solving the by solving the least square problem, then uh, they did a line search after after computing the the coefficient a, then they add this model to to the to the to the model f. So that's how um, how the how how the learning is is proceed is uh, is, is conducted. So this is, this is only a generic algorithm, and the MAR is a particular implementation, particular implementation of this algorithm by combining gradient boosting with the regression trees. So this is a MAR, it's a multi, multi, multiple additive regression trees. And so, uh, it's, so, so basically what is the implementation of this generic algorithm? They, they use a regression trees to, uh, to solve this least square problem. And uh, so, Regression tree is a J-terminal node regression trees. So, just in case you're not familiar with the regression trees, so J-terminal node means. So this is a. One, two, three, four, J. So J-terminal node, and so in the in the two-dimensional case, it's basically. So you have a feature one and a feature two. So basically, what it does, you, you do the partition of the space. We have samples. So basically, the partition the samples into recursively into this kind of uh, regions. So that's a uh, one, two, three. I draw too many. It's a J. So that's uh, so that's basically what tree uh, how, how tree algorithm works. So. Uh, so that's why. So they uh, they fix the numbers, they fix the tree size, and uh, notice that we use the we need the the response is actually is actually the derivatives. So therefore, they need to compute the first derivatives and use that to learn the trees. And uh, for 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 line search, what what Jerry did is uh, well instead of doing the full line search, they use the one step Newton updates. So to do Newton updates, we need the first derivative and the second derivative. So this is a this is the second derivative. So this is the first derivative and the second derivative. So therefore, uh, this is a very simple algorithm for, uh, uh, for implementing the generic boosting algorithms. And also notice that for every class, they build a tree. So in order to do this, uh, to do this means we actually use diagonal approximations. That's why you can do the uh, Newton updates for each region, because of the diagonal approximation. And also notice this additional parameter mu. Uh, the the parameter mu is a very small factor, which is like 0.1, just to avoid overfitting. Because you're doing the Newton updates, so you can overshoot, and uh, so the mu is uh, for protecting, uh, for for protective purposes. You must it must be there, but uh, it doesn't have to be there all the time. But uh, for convenience, so let's just put there, and uh, as Jerry did. So so therefore, th this algorithm is very easy to understand. Because they use the first derivatives to learn the structure of the trees, and they use the second derivatives to uh, to determine the value of the terminal nodes. And uh, there's a heuristic factor for considering the only k minus one degrees of freedom, and they use a shrinkage to avoid overfitting. So it's uh, remarkably stable, as uh, some of you already know, and uh, and a very good performance can be obtained from 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 this algorithm. And it's not very sensitive to the parameters. So the three parameters, which is a uh, uh, the three parameters, which are the number ter number iterations m, and the, the terminal node number terminal nodes and the shrinkage. So the number terminal node is the main is the main factor is the main parameter, and the other other parameters are not too important. But the number terminal nodes determine the capacity of the base learner and is the most uh, ha is most important in terms of the performance. And but even though the the performance not too sensitive to j, as long as it falls into the some reasonable region. So, sorry. Yeah. Well, uh, he suggests the point one. You know, because when you do Newton updates, right, you only do one step, so anything can happen. So, 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 so that's why they they, they put a value like point one just just for protecting purposes, and uh, that's what I think. And of course, you can also think about this as a shrinkage. You think you don't do as a, uh, you don't do too greedy. Just use a small, small value. I, I don't, I don't quite believe that. What, what, what I really believe is that this is really for numerical purposes. And uh, 
yeah. So you were asking what's the optimal value. Yeah, I, the optimal value is I don't know. Yeah, and uh, I always try to point one. So that's usually uh, works, but in some cases actually point two works better. And uh, except uh, when you write papers, you just always try to avoid. Uh, uh, you try, try to make it simple, so just uh, point one. Yeah. And uh, as a smaller one, smaller values does not necessarily help. Because small, because if you new, because uh, if your value is too small, that means you don't make enough progress at each step. So that uh, when if you too small, actually the convergence is too slow, and the, the testing performance is bad. So it's not necessarily true that smaller value will need better performance. Yeah. But you should actually, I believe, larger values, if, if possible, is better. If you can do it, use the larger values. Uh, that's what I, I, I would suggest. First of all, since you are able to take the first and second derivative, what's the problem with the standard gradient descent of the Newton's method? Why is that a lot better than the standard Newton's method? Which is good? Uh, okay. So this is the, because once you, uh, you mean why they do this, uh, once, yeah, so this is for convenience. You know, for, for trees, right, a good thing about trees is that uh, every region has the same constant values, has, has one value. Every region has one value. And uh, if you do the one, one step updates, you start from zero, right? Then you update to one, one particular value. Then, then that's, that's much more than, uh, than one step. Uh, let's see. If you want to do, if you want to continue, it has, it's actually not as convenient because uh, because the function value is a constant. It's just that's, that's why it's most convenient if you just do one step. And uh, my experience is that let's see. Also because we do the diagonal approximation already, so if you and more like more iterations, I, I don't believe it's, it's going to help. Yeah, because you already. Start with the approximate approximations. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, because of this diagonal approximation, it really brings in a huge simplifications because of the the fact that taking advantage of the fact that the the the, the function value is zero is is constant within each region, and notice that they uh, they actually because of this diagonal approximation they allow you to to combine combine these two steps in one step because in when you build a tree, right, you also have a function value. However, uh, when you do a line search, you have another multiplication to the function values. So this allow you, so this one step Newton updates allow you to do this, uh, uh, to obtain the value one step instead of two steps. So it's very, I think it's a very clever idea. And uh, yeah. All right. So, so now, now let's, uh, let's uh, look at this uh, constraint again, the sum to zero constraints. Uh, because we start with this loss function, and uh, there's uh, this probability model, and we have this sum to zero constraints, and without loss of generality, we can assume the class one, the k equal to zero, is a base class, a reference class, a baseline class. So, so that means we can just use, represent the class zero as a, as a, as a sum of the, all the R function values and put a negative sign in the front. So, so that's the uh, constraints. And, uh, and uh, we can get a different set of derivatives if we, treat, if we view the class zero as a base class. You get different sets of derivatives where you have to, you have, uh, well, so this is the, so uh, they look different from, from these derivatives. And I will explain why they look different. And uh, well, and they also, because we use class zero as a reference class, or base class, so now the derivatives has this uh, information uh, in it. So let's, let's do a little bit of math to show that there are indeed this kind of derivatives. So, so first, so because th uh, this is the uh, only math I'm, I'm going to do for this, for this paper and this talk. So, so, so let's do it. Otherwise, I won't make it 40 minutes. So, so we, we start with the probability model. And we can represent the function value f0 as the sum, the negative sum of the rest. So that's, that's, that's the same. So that's easy. So now let's, let's do derivatives. How do we do derivatives? Well, we have the product of two terms. So we'll, we'll do the derivatives of, of this guy, which is the same. Then, then that's the same. 
now we do the derivatives of this guy. So we take, we take the square, and uh, then we need to take a derivative of uh, fk inside here. So that only has one fk, so we, it, it keeps there. And then all the rest also has fk here. So therefore, you, you, you still get uh, uh, minus f, f0. Of course, you could, you, by, by chain rule, you get a negative sign here. So that's how you get that derivative. And then by simplifications, uh, because, of, because pk is represented at this form, so therefore, after simplifications, you will see that eventually we get this kind of derivatives. So then this just to, 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 to help you build some confidence on the, on the calculation I did. So which is a very simple, uh, simple algebra. So, uh, so this is the first derivative of the probability with respect to function values. And uh, now we have this loss function, and, uh, which, is a, which, is a, which is some of k terms. And so it can be represented as, a, as a three parts. So the first part starts with one, but which is, does not con contain the k. The second part only, only, the, only the, k, the k class and also the base class. So we apply the chain rule and apply the previous results. And you can see that you can get the first derivatives in this form. And the second derivative is even easier because now you further take a derivatives, you only need derivatives of p respect to function value and pk, p, pi and pk with the respective function values. So you can get the first derivatives and second derivatives very easily. So uh, this is just to convince you that uh, this, they, are, they are the true derivatives if you believe in the models. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so now the, the next question is uh, which, which, which reference class or base class to use? If you, if you think, if, you, if we know that those are the true derivatives, except the only trouble is that we need, the, we, we, need the, we, we need to choose one particular base class. So which class to choose? So this, this leads to the idea of base, adaptive base class boost. The two key ideas is that we can formulate the multi-class boosting algorithm by considering base class. And we do not have to worry to train for the base class because the sum to zero constraints. And at each boosting step, adaptively choose the base class. Because we do boosting many steps anyway, so let's choose that adaptively. And uh, so that's why I call adaptive base class boost. So, so now the next question, how do we choose adaptive, adaptively choose the base class? So we should choose the base class according to the performance, like training loss. So this is one of many ideas. Uh, yeah, I implement many kinds of ideas. Now, this is the idea that's uh, like least clever, but uh, giving me the least criticism, I guess, is that we can exhaustively search for all k base classes and choose the base class that leads to the best performance. Uh, means smallest training loss. You can use a, a validation loss to do it, but uh, I believe that won't make an essential difference. And uh, so the only, com only, the only criticism for this is computation expensive, but not too bad if, unless k is really large. Uh, for search engine, if k is a five, it's not too big a deal. And it's a good performance can be achieved. And the many other ideas, which I'll tell you if I come back next year. So, so, so ABCMAR, so this is the generic algorithms. ABCMAR is that one particular implementation of this ABC boost, is that we combine MAR with the ABC boost, we get ABCMAR. So, so that's the algorithm. And uh, so this is basically the MAR. And uh, I call it a pseudo pseudo code because it's not even the correct code for ABC MAR. So it's a pseudo pseudo code. So, so what do we need to do with the MAR? Well, we need to replace the first derivative with the, with the, with the true first derivative and replace the first, second derivative with the true first, first derivative. And then we, need to, we don't need this uh, heuristic term because it's going to be recovered naturally. And uh, we need an additional for loop here. So we, we try every class as base from 0 to k minus 1. Of course, inside the loop, we do not have to try this. Uh, if it's already the base, then we do not need to train because it can be referred, inferred from the, ba from the other classes. So this is the only thing changing we need. Of course, we need to do a little bit of things here. That's why I call this pseudo pseudo code. Uh, yeah. So, so the change is minimal. It looks like um, the base class in your presentation is really mainly for the computational convenience. You need to have the base class in order to define certain numbers. But I think in practice, uh -huh. does base class refer to something 
which you may have been more, most of reliable cars in your training car, maybe it has large number of training companies. Uh, it's like it's related to what we're talking about, right? If you can lock the number of tokens, then the loss will be you will contribute the most to the loss. Uh, reduction of the loss. Oh, yeah. That's just many for computation or tool. Yeah, that, and that's why I said the many many ideas how to how to implement. Yeah, so so exhaustive search is uh, is seems seems to me is the is is the most natural thing to do, right? Because that's the best thing you can do is to find the one that's least the smallest loss, and uh, most reliable also means you. Uh, so so uh, yeah so. I believe that uh, the many ideas may, may be better ideas than, than, than exhaustive search. Yeah, there's something you can always try. And uh, as I said, the, the change is minimal if you already have the code. So, and uh, yeah, for, for experience of programming in Microsoft, you need a couple, of, maybe one hour to do it, maybe less than an hour, yeah, to do it. Wait, do you have any intuition about what, what would make a good base class? You know, or, or, is it like more common? Classes that are more common are better, or classes that are more uniform according to the features, or anything like that? You said you did have uh, some approximation that's faster than the yeah. cost of search. Okay. Are, are there any qualities like that that you would expect intuitively would make a good base class? Because I don't see any reason why you favor one over the other. Uh, for, for example, for example, the, the one with, uh, with the largest sample, largest labels, I mean, the one with the most common class, as beginning is a good base class. If you, do, if you do experiment, you will notice that at the beginning it's a good basic, but after a while you want to change that. You want to change that because, after, because, uh, because the most common class at the beginning, if you use that as basic class, then after a while it's no longer the, it's no, the, 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 the optimization, I mean, you, you, you have exhausted all the, all, all the advantages of using that as basic class. So you want, you want to change after a while, but if you only stick with the most common class, you're not going to get good performance eventually. But at the beginning, it's a good starting point. Yeah. So that, that, that's a very good intuition. Yeah. So will this loop change the base class as time goes on? Because you put it in. Uh, well, this will change yeah. as time goes on. Uh -huh. So you're saying in the very beginning, you want to use the big fat head. And then as you, get, as you learn more, you start to get more subtlety towards the tail. Uh, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. You can think that, yeah. But uh, so this is what. At the beginning, it was almost always at least to the class with the most labels. Yeah. Uh, Chris? So I just have a comment about bombs. Um, uh -huh. So it's actually not a comment I've talked about, but this shrinkage parameter new, which uh -huh. I'm not right there, this is why I'm uh -huh. coming right now. Oh. Wait, 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 wait. Um, always was very mysterious to me. It is a step size, uh -huh. but if you set it equal to one, typically in experiments, the training just learns really fast. I mean, it, it just right, uh -huh. it learns the whole you need fewer trees to fit the training set. Uh -huh. So it does kind of a fit, but it's not clear why it's a fitting because if it's the correct step size, if, it, if the Hessian's a good approximation, then, then you uh -huh. should work. And so Ofer pointed out that recently that you can also view new as simply a way of scaling the Fs. So if you think of a two-class case where I have a sigmoid, mm -hmm. the flatness of that sigmoid is, is controlled by new. That's another way to look at it, right? Because it occurs in every every F. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what you're doing really is regularizing by just changing how, how flat that thing is. There's another way to look at new that to me makes a lot more sense than I just I never understood the other way of looking at new. Yeah, so that's uh, maybe, maybe we should do more experiments on that. So one thing you can do is uh, it's what well, because because the one step Newton updates, you know, eventually when this uh, eventually uh, you 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 will be very close to to singular at some point. You will be close because the, the p go to zero. It's not you. You, at some point, you you you're gonna reach the pure pure nodes, right? At some point, means the uh, the p some p some region the p is zero, close to zero, and uh, so that you're gonna have problems because the the update is very large. Of course, you can always put large values. I mean, new is fixed for all iterations of point one or whatever you want. Uh -huh. Yeah. So. so, but but the p changes, right? If the p changes that to, to be very small, and then some at some point you. Uh, you uh, at, at some point, at least for some cases, it's going to, it's, what's going to happen is that this value becomes really large. But if that's the problem we want to address, I would want to detect that as happening to something else, right? I mean, uh, fix yeah. the same new for yeah. can, I just wanted to point that out. It's always yeah. been mysterious to me. It, it, it is. It I is. think it's a, 
it just makes more sense to view it as how flat the signal is as a way of regularizing the problem. It's a way of regularizing the model. Yeah. It's, it's, you're choosing a differently shaped function by like, by very Compare with the only mark, that means it's new. No, this is, I'm, talking about the original, I'm talking about the original mark. Yeah, if you compare it's a point well, I still, still use the same, I still use the, I still use new here. Yeah. New, new is fixed during training in the original mark. Yeah. <coughs> so, 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 yeah. So let's look at the, um, the experiments first. So I try, I try many data sets. So this is the, the data sets people commonly use, that people like to use. And, well, except the first one, because the people like to use a subset of it, since it's a bit it's too large. It's a cover type. It's all in the US, uh, UCI. So the first one has about 60, uh, 600,000. And I just use half for training, half for testing. And, uh, and all the rest, people had lots of experiments and reported lots of, uh, lots of results on, this, on, on those data sets. So the latter is a very famous one. And it has a 16,000 training and 4,000 for testing. So that 4K basically just swap the training and testing. So that way we can see diff the performance. And uh, because, because this, if we only use a 4,000 for training, it, uh, the, uh, the, the result, the test, the training, te the test error is going to be fairly large. And uh, it's more obvious to see, the, to see the performance difference. And letter 2K is only use a half of this training for, test, for, for training. And uh, so we have more, have larger uh, testing sets, and uh, with much smaller training set. So all the rest, they, they we we use a very standard partition of training and testing. So that's why I get this uh, funny numbers. But this, those are, those numbers are not, were not specified uh, specified by me. So it's uh, it's just there. And uh, so the number of features from 54, 16 to 256, uh, 617. So. So those are standard data sets people like to use. And uh, like to, uh, let's look at the performance. Is that, so this is a mar uh, number, number of uh, misclassification errors. If you want error rate, you just divide this number by this number of test samples. So for example, the error rate of letter will be 99 divided by 4,000 is going to be less than 2.5%. And uh, so this is a mark error, number of errors. No, uh, this is a, number of errors for ABC MAR. We can see the relative improvements. What's the relative improvement? So the errors of MAR subtract the errors of ABC MAR and normalize by the errors of MAR. So we get relative improvements, about 10 or 20%. So it's not too exciting, but it's very hard to get those kind of improve improvements nowadays after machine learning has, 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 has been developed and for so many years. So and uh, I can also afford to compute the p-values yeah, so we can see the p-value very small, and when it's zero, it means very small number. So I just report zero. So this is the the summary of test misclassification errors. Did you use similar trees for each? Oh. Yeah, I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna so I will, I want to do everything fair, and uh, so is people lots of questions. One question is the improvement due to the particular choice of the parameters. So well, okay. So let's report the experiment with a series of parameters from mu from 0.04, because Jerry says, yes, mu should be less than 0.1. So let's just from, I cannot afford to compute too many. So let's just use 0.04 to 0.1. So I have four different, uh, four different parameters. Uh, if I use a fire, the table is too big to fit in the paper, I guess. Then I, then I term, number of terminal nodes, I change, if Jerry suggests uh, this number should be like A or 6. And I, so I just try from 4 to 20. And J equal to 2, the decision, this, a decision stump or a two terminal nodes is just not good. So we, we should not use that unless it's a very special kind, kind of data sets. Otherwise, it's not good performance. So I tried uh, terminal nodes from 4 to 20. I don't know why I choose even numbers, but we can try odd numbers, I guess, by using even numbers. <laughs> it looks better. That's what, and I tried the number, number of iterations. I tried 10,000 at most. means I just train until the machine accuracy is reached. We, we would, for industry data, we we're never going to see the machine accuracy reach because uh, that's way too many iterations. But uh, I try, I, for some data sets like letter, the machine accuracy will be reached before 10, m equal to 10,000. Yeah. So then I stop. So now it's an improvement due to the incompetent implementation of MAR. So we also get the results from Jerry, Jerry Friedman's uh, MAR program, so compare them. So is the computation efficiency an issue? Well, it's true that training is slower, but testing is faster. Why testing is faster? 
because we only have to evaluate k minus one trees, right? So instead of k trees, so that testing fast also because the training is faster, you, uh, we're going to see the convergence is faster. So therefore, we may be able to stop at an earlier stage of, uh, of the training. So therefore, training testing is actually faster. So that's actually most important, I think, for many cases. So training is slower, but uh, you know, it may take a little bit of time. But uh, I guess in some cases, you can, you can, we can afford it. You just let the computer run and go to the bathroom and come back and see the results. And, or, or, or come to go to the gym or go to Hawaii or something and come back and then training may be done. So, so, that's, so that's, the, that's another issue, but it's still an issue. So, so this, is the, this is the more complete experiment for the data sets. So I tried like a four, like a four different learning rates or a shrinkage or mu, new from 4.04 to 0.1 and, and the many, many tree size from 4 to 20. And uh, I, I report the minimum values of the test error. So, so this is for Mark. So what I got is a 143, for example, 129. And this is a Friedman program, get a 143. And, uh, but overall, they're very close. In some cases, for example, I need to find the cases that, as an example, one, Friedman is a 144, I got a 145. So they, you cannot expect they, they will be identical because of the implementation details. Can someone tell me why they could be different? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is my implementation. This is a Friedman's implementation. Yeah. So I guess the most obvious place why they could be different is uh, when, you, when, you, when, you split the, when you split the data, right, you can choose. You have to choose a point that's between in the area where there's no data. You have, you have to make arbitrary, maybe clever choice. But any clever choice will sometimes lead to like, uh, undesirable performance. So, so I think so, so it's, it's, it's uh, understandable why the performance can be diff slightly different. So, so, but I always report the same uh, implementation instead of a freedom of implementation. So that, that, that way, uh, but this is just for uh, comparisons. We, a nice thing about Mara, you can see that the performance is uh, fairly stable uh, across many choices of uh, parameters. So that, this is very nice un unless the, the, the base learner is too weak to, to, to produce good results. But all other choices seem very, very stable, like around 140, 130. So that, that's very nice. Yeah, so we like those kind of algorithms that are very stable for uh, insensitive to the choice of parameters. If, it, if a program works very well, but, but it changes the parameter a little bit, it, the performance degree, degraded. Uh, so then that, that's not good for, at least for industry applications. Maybe very good for papers, but, 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 I, but I think industry will, will, will prefer algorithms that are very stable for the uh, particular choice of the parameters. So this is for MAR, and this is ABC MAR. So we re report the same experiment using exactly the same implementation, and also this is the number, the percentage of improvements. So this is like 25% relative improvements. Yeah. So this is a res this is improvements uh, respect to this number, not this number. Otherwise, this number will be even bigger improvements. So what that would be attempting to do, but I just report this number respect to that number. So 25% improvements. So we can see the improvements. They're also very stable, so from 100 to 110, the error, and the improvements, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's an interesting improvement. So again, so these are set trees with each type of... Uh, that's not a very good question. You always ask very good questions ahead of, uh, several slides ahead of me. So let's look at the, the training loss and test loss. So I always train till machine accuracy is reached and over, or, or up to 1,000, uh, 10,000 iterations. So, so this is a training loss, because and so the training loss, it's, it's interesting that Mark can reach at most like 10 to the 10 to the minus 14. That's what I observe. It's after like such a small, small like uh, numbers. There's lots of things that can affect the the the, the these numbers, but uh, that's why there's some some kind of I cannot explain why there's a little thing here. But uh, after reaching that 10 to the near 10 to the minus 14, 16 or 14. There's some weird behavior. But in general, we can see that ABC mark converges faster at every, every iteration, converges faster than mark. And uh, you can reach the, reach the machine accuracy, but mark cannot reach machine accuracy after certain iterations. So again, I, yeah, so that's, the, that's what I've done for, for, for training and for testing. So, so this is the, the uh, the test errors for every for all the iterations. 
So this number I reported is the lowest point. It's like, a, like this point, mm -hmm. lowest point, or this point. And, the, and the for ABC mark, it's always almost the lowest point. But for mark, because of uh, this behavior, after a while, you cannot, the machine accuracy, after reaching close to the machine accuracy, the, the training loss cannot go down any further. So actually, it actually the error goes up very, very but I don't, I don't report this number, I report this number. So, so it's not the same number of iterations. But, but that's why I show this figure. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's obvious. Of course, we can stop here or any, any earlier place and we can see the improvements. So, so yeah. So I try to do all kinds of things to, 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 to answer any possible questions. And uh, so this is a different data set. For like, uh, if you only use a two K sample, so we're going to see that, uh, see similar, like a uh, freedom implementation is very similar, similar results. And uh, they're very stable across many choice of parameters. This is for MAR and ABC MAR, the improvement is about 10% in this case. But 10% because of, because of the, the sample size is very large, the test sample size is very large. So the statistically very significant. And the, again, it's very stable improvements. And also this is the testing. We can see that this is a, uh, for, I, I always report like this point, which is almost the same at this point, uh, versus uh, this point, yeah, for, for MAR and ABC MAR. So this is a different data sets. So maybe another data set, pan digit, we can see the similar, similar things, very stable, and the similar performance uh, with different implementations of MAR, and uh, like a 10 or 20% improvements in ABC MAR. And uh, we can see the, the improvements for different trees is, is kind of also obvious improvements for this data set. And again, I always report the lowest point. So, so how, how, no matter how, how, yeah, how you up to you to interpret the results. So this is a isolate data set is kind of high dimensional. So I only did a, so I, I so, so I, I only filled the partial table. Yeah, I was waiting for my grant proposal to fill the whole table. Yeah. So, so, so this is the. Uh, uh, okay, the partial table, but we can see, still see the, the improvements like. 10 or 20 percent improvements for this high dimensional data and uh, see, see, see some, of, some of the interesting things. And uh, one, one thing interesting is that uh, it's no longer true that, it's not necessarily true that using larger trees will lead to better performance. For example, you using 20 nodes is not, maybe the performance not as, uh, uh, not as good as uh, you only using like uh, six nodes. Yeah. So it's, this is a, uh, yeah. But the, my, my, my point is to show the improvements comparing with MAR side by side, not to show, for, not, not for particular parameters. And I believe eventually if you choose uh, maybe J equal to 100 or something, the performance will be the same because the base class is so. So at some point, they, they may not, uh, ABC, MAR, ABC MAR is not going to improve anymore. But uh, at least for this reasonable parameters, the, the, the improvements is kind of obvious. A couple more slides, I'm done. So, so this is another experiment to cover type it's because it's a very large data set. So I also, so, uh, I did the experiments for 5,000 steps and I also report the improvements, I mean the, the results for 1,000 or 2,000, 3,000 iterations. So we can see that instead of uh, only like 8% improvements, if we stop earlier, we're going to get like, we're going to get like 20% improvements. So this is the same number of iterations. Yeah, so just to show they can, yeah, it's, it's a fairly large data set. So if we stop earlier, we're going to hire a much, much better improvements, like a 10, 10 or 20 percent for this data set. So it's almost done. So some more insights here is that when K, uh, any, any questions about the experiments? Yeah. Yeah, that's hard, right? Yeah, no, it's not too high. So it, it, uh, yeah, two, three hundred, and uh, so seven hundred, six hundred, like, like this case, six hundred. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In this data set, you don't have that set, development set, which is you supposed to be used to tune the parameters, that uh, new, uh -huh. you know, J yeah. parameter, and you're supposed to use that to tune the parameter and you report whatever number you can come out of the chain. The depth set to do that set. Yeah, you're talking about validation set, right? They, uh, yeah. Wait, yeah. Do they have a validation set in this case? No, they don't have validation sets. But the, you know, the, the, again, the purpose is to compare side by side. Because the underlying implementation, 
or ABC model the same. Underlying implementation is the same. So this is a fair comparison because uh, as I, I, don't, I, I don't care what, what parameter we're using as long as for the same parameter I get more improvements. So this is, I think, is a fair comparison. Yeah, but that's uh, good. If, uh, if I want to compare this with the other algorithms, then I need to yeah, do something different. So, so the, there's some more insights about this. Uh, so when k is equal to 2, ABC mar actually recovers mar, which is kind of obvious because the first derivatives become twice the first derivative of the ABC mar become twice of the first derivative used in mar, and the second derivative become four times of the second derivative used in mar. So the factor that k minus 1 over k, which is a half in this case, is recovered, but not because of 1 half, because of 3, 2 over 4. So, and then when k larger than 2, the mar derivatives actually kind of like average ABC mar derivatives. So in, this is what, what I get. So for the, this is the derivative used in mar, and if we use the First derivatives, if you average over all bases, it's actually k times as large, exactly k times as large. And for the second derivatives, the, uh, if you sum over all second derivatives, it's going to be larger than, the, larger than k plus 2 times the second derivative used in mar. It's not a, it's a inequality. It becomes equality only when k equal to 2. So, so this means k minus over k, this factor, this magic factor, may be reasonably replaced by k over k plus 2, or, or even smaller. So also means, what this means, uh, the mu in my program, in ABC mar is actually slower, it is smaller, effectively smaller, than the, than the mu used, used, in, used in mar. Yeah. But the, again, because uh, now I tried, I tried many, many, many mu, so, they, you know, so at least uh, that, so that should not be a criticism. Uh, the, yeah. So, so the, the conclusion is that, that boosting often achieves good performance, as everybody in this room knows. And two key ideas are that we can formulate the boosting algorithm by considering base costs, and then we adaptively select the base cost at each boosting iterations. And uh, here I only, rep only report you to you a particular implementation of ABC MAR. And uh, I have several other implementations on ongoing, and uh, I, I call them different names. So, but this is one particular implementation, and the, the, the improvements in this data set is about 10 to 20 percent. So, thank you very much. So. Any more questions? Any more questions? Well, actually, in engineering, very often we use a uh, maximum entropy model. It's very similar to the yeah, that's that's exactly the same as logistics. It's, it's, it's not constrained. We normally don't use the constraint to add up the features to something one. Sum to zero. Right? Sum to zero. To, 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 uh, I don't know what is it. I mean, you I did, you actually mentioned that there's identifiability problem. I, I can see why that is the problem there. Your ultimate goal is to identify the class, right? Mm -hmm. So don't you worry about identif identifiability problem. I mean, in earlier slide you have plus C there. So you uh -huh. SEO without having C it doesn't really matter as long as you know features are chosen already. Okay. So what is that so does that constraint help you to solve the uh, the optimization problem or not? Well if you it? believe first if you believe that constraint, if you think there should be some relations among the Fs, then this that constraint is one natural choice. So if you believe that constraint makes sense. But what? Any practical application, all I care about is to get the right yeah. feature that distinguishes <coughs> what should they add up to, to one. Yeah, all you care is, is one thing from what the, what the model should be is a different thing, right? So if the model, if there, there should be a constraint, if you, if you believe there should be a constraint because all the functions, they, they should, they, they, they're related in a way, but they're not unrelated. So, so that means, now once you consider that constraint, then you actually really cut your search space, right? So you can, if, once you cut such a space, then you can, uh, you can do better at, each, at every iterations. Because, because this, is a, this is basically from maximum likelihood estimation point of view. If from maximum likelihood point of, estimation point of view, uh, if you start with the true model, if, because your, your goal is to maximize likelihood, so if you start the true derivatives, you can, you, you're going to reach the, the maximum likelihood, uh, like a, you're closer to the maximum likelihood, right? So you get that, which means a faster convergence. That's why you get a faster convergence at every iteration. Of course, this is a greedy algorithm, so there's no, no guarantee about global. Uh, it's faster, but, uh, but 
at least uh, each global uh, locally is faster. And, uh, and uh, so that will lead to better performance. Yeah. And it helps with uh, optimization. Yeah, so it has to do with optimizations. And uh, of course, you, uh, yeah, so that's the, yeah. The unconstrained optimization is easier than constrained, though, right? Yes, but this is a, this is an inequality con this is an equality constraint, right? It's an easy constraint. <laughs> yeah. It's easier, it's easier than inequality, but it's still easier if you don't have any. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's still easy, right? It's just the uh, yeah. If you yeah. Also, with with the maxim model, typically you you use a regularizer, and if you have an up to regularization term, then it's, you you still have identifiability, and you might even have uh, you might even, I, I think it might even be something like you end up with. The sum to zero constraint just automatically. If you do unconstrained optimization, yeah, I know, I know. Is there something? Like that? Yeah, just that, except the, like you can you can write down the loss function, then lambda summation square, right? You can write that. You can, that that will actually naturally leads to if you lambda large enough means you have to force them sum to small the sum to zero, and you can you can probably do something like that. Yeah, and that's actually an interesting perspective, except the. Yeah, if you do that in trees, I'm not sure how can you do the Newton updates uh, for each regions. So, so this is a, the diagonal approximation and Newton updates make it's really convenient because you just do each region separately. So, so that's the huge advantage. And I, I don't know, and because 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 it can do the optimization or Newton updates for each region separately, it converges faster because of the local. Is maximize uh, it because it's it's more greedy. But if you just do the, if you formulate this as a constraint optimization problem, then you try to do the global Newton updates, then it's not going to do as well, because if it it does the same thing for the same for the tree, but without considering considering each individual regions, then then the convergence is slow. I train I tried that last year for the whole year. I mean for 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 long period of time, that's why it leads to this algorithm. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a very simple observation, it's a very simple discovery, but only after many hours of working on unsuccessfully on unrelated on, on things. Yeah. 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 So I believe in all the data you have, all the features are providing the database. So, so all you learn is the beta, the uh, the linear weight. Uh, not linear weights. The so, so you, you uh, well, is the structure of the trees and the fun the value of the trees. Okay. Yeah, the structure of the tree and value. Of, F yeah. equals beta multiplied by x. And so that, do you know beta or do you know the whole F? Uh, I don't. I don't do that at all. <coughs> that's the logistic regression. Yeah, and that's a, yeah, but that's not done here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>